you pray with me this morning? God, we pray that your love would be a river of life flowing through us, that we would know you and that our, the chief desire of our heart would be to know you. God, on the other side of the coin would be that we would want to make you known, that as we've experienced your grace, your mercy, your salvation, we've experienced it abundantly, God. Would our hearts yearn to see those who are near to us but far from you experience that freedom? God, make us a church who knows you and yearns and drives to make you known. God, for your glory, chiefly for your glory, and God, for our joy to see our friends, our family workers, our classmates come to know you and to experience the joy. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. As you are, uh, we're going to be in James 2, 8 through 13. And I want to take a moment just to welcome you who are watching online. Uh, we are glad that you are with us and uh, can't wait to have you back in person with us. And believe that will be soon. Uh, uh, we are James 2 this morning, 8 through 13. James 2, 8 through 13. Uh, excited this morning to spend some time talking about who we are uh, as a church. Excited to spend some time this morning uh, really kind of helping remind us what we're aimed at, how God has wired us and what we hope God does through us. And, uh, and so we are uh, this morning taking a break from the book of Mark. We'll be in uh, Mark chapter nine next week where we look at the transfiguration of Jesus. And I'm telling you right now, you do not want to miss next week. Ken Bell is, is preaching and like, it's going to be great. You're going to love it. And uh, it is, yeah, it's the, it's the climax of the book of Mark. It's where Jesus shows himself as God and like, you can't get better preaching material than that. So I don't know why I gave that away, but Ken is preaching next week. I'm super excited about it. This week, what I want to do is I want to continually put in front of us who we are as a church, like who God has made us to be and what we believe as leadership God is calling us to. Uh, and we've kind of defined these in four different marks of a church. Church, uh, uh, four marks that we want to become and four marks that we are becoming. And so the first, the first mark uh, of our church is, of a church that we want to become is we are not done yet, that we want to be defined by a relentless pursuit of who Jesus is. That just as Adam said this morning, we woke up and we're not in heaven, which signals we're not done yet. There's work to be done. There's Jesus to be pursued. And whether we're eight years old or 80, we want to spend every waking moment getting to know who Jesus is, making him known as well. Uh, another mark of our church is we want to practice uncommon hospitality. And what that means is we view all that God has given us, our homes, our money, our kids, all of that to be his to do what he wants with. And in an era of disconnected, disconnectedness and, and tall fences, we want to be a church of short fences and open doors where our neighbors can come and spend time at our table. Our neighbors can see our kids in the backyard. Our neighbors can come and uh, help us with yard work for the glory of God. That we would be, that part especially, uh, that we would be a people who practice uncommon hospitality in an age of isolation. We also wanna be uh, champions for the family. And what we mean by that is we're not satisfied with being a church that is a flash in the pan in Missoula. We have no patience for that. No desire for that. We want to make a difference so that my kids and their grandkids and the kids that come after that experience Missoula that's different. And so we are champions for the family. We see, we see everything running through the family and society. That if we can teach moms and dads how to love one another well and kids how to grow up and how to date well and how to be single well and all of these things, that we can begin to reclaim this idea of what the biblical family looks like and that will draw people to Jesus. And so uh, those are three. The fourth uh, that we're gonna press into this morning is, I man, we love our neighbors. We love our neighbors. That as a church, we want to be marked by a distinct passion for those that God has put in our lives that we see Missoula uh, not as an accidental placement, but that we are where we are in Missoula. We have the people around us uh, living in apartments in, in the South Hills, not by accident, but by God's providential design, and that you have people in your workplace and your families that God has placed there for a reason. And so, and so our response to that is say, we want to love our neighbors well. And so what I wanna do this morning is spend some time working through the book of James, chapter two, verses eight through 13, and I want to I kind of highlight 
uh, an impediment to loving our neighbors that James highlights in his church. Uh, and so James is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. This was the first book written in the New Testament. Uh, it was written for 42 or 45 AD, so 12 to 15 years after Christ came. And, and it really encompasses what the early church struggled with. When you read the book of James, you're reading what the earliest church, the earliest Christians struggled with in their faith. And so James writes this five chapter, five chapter letter, which really is, is aimed at the idea that if we, if we follow God well, if we love God with all of our being and we love our neighbor, we will do well as Christians. And so uh, in chapter two, he points out an impediment. He points out a, uh, a roadblock to loving our neighbors well. And he places before the people in, in, uh, in Jerusalem, hey, here are two options. If you do this, good. If you don't do this, that's not great. And then a command. And so what we're gonna do this morning is we're gonna look at uh, the problems in chapter two and kind of draw out what it looks like to love our neighbors well this morning. The chief problem of the church in Jerusalem was that people were valued by what they had and not by who they were. This was the chief problem of the early church in Jerusalem in this particular area is that they valued people for what they had, what they brought to the table and not on the basis of how God has made them. So we'll get into that. Uh, right away. Our outline is there's an encouragement that James gives, there's a warning that James gives, and then a command that James gives. We'll start first with the encouragement in verse 8. An encouragement from James as he is setting before the church and us, here are two options you can follow uh, depending on, uh, on how you're led. Number one, uh, verse 8, follow along in your copies of God's Word. If you really fulfill the royal law, James says, according to the scripture, and he quotes this scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is from Deuteronomy, uh, this is from, uh, I'm sorry, Leviticus 19.18. He's quoting right out of the Old Testament. He says, if you want to really fulfill the royal law, the royal law is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, if you do this well, you are doing well. He looks at the church and says, if you want to know how healthy your faith is, if you want to know how close you are to the heart of Jesus, if you want to know, if you want to know what it looks like to, to get a barometer, a, a self-check, well, the question for you is, how well do you love your neighbor as yourself? James says, if you do this really well, then you do well. We would do well to listen to those words and apply them into our own life. We see Jesus summing up the Old Testament law in two different ways. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. Basically, all that you are, you love the Lord your God. And then the second piece is you love your neighbor. In other words, these two things have to go together for Christian health, that you can love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And yet, if you do not love your neighbor, this is all information and it hasn't led to transformation. That theology, theology learned without being applied is just pride. That if we just learn information about God, but never move it into our lives, we are accumulating for ourselves pride. And the, the balance is loving our neighbor. So I'm going to stop and, and I want to kind of tease out this command, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and, and kind of ask ourselves three different questions. The first question is, what is love? Like, what is, what is this love that, that, uh, that James is talking about, that, that Moses talked about, that Jesus talked about? What is this love? Well, this love is agape love. It is characterized by self sacrificial love. In other words, you give something of yourself and that is, that is motivated by an affection for someone else. This affection isn't from within you. It's in response to what God has done. So what it is, it's agape love. It is a self-sacrificial love motivated and driven by the affection of God for that person. So you don't have to generate your own love. You work from God's love for you. It goes out from you in acts, in genuine, tangible acts, motivated by the love of God. In other words, this agape love is intentional. It is not aspirational. We cannot just say, we love our neighbors and not love our neighbors. That is lip service. And that is not acceptable to God. In other words, agape love is felt, or is not felt, it is acted out. It is more often seen than heard, and it is experienced by someone. In other words, agape love is aimed at another image bearer of Christ. Then when we talk about loving your neighbor or uh, an image bearer of God, then we look at our neighbors and say, you are worthy of dignity, love, and respect. And so I want to, because God has loved me, given me mercy, and given me grace. I want to expend, extend tangible love to you. One thing to note here 
is that this is a positive command. It defines love positively. We tend to, because we're broken sinners, define loving our neighbors negatively. Let me illustrate. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you've done these things. We tend to define it negatively and we say, well, I love my neighbor because I never complain about the size of their lawn and how unruly it is. I love my neighbor, but I don't leave passive aggressive notes on their, no- on their cars when they park in my spot. I really love my neighbors. I love my neighbors because I don't complain to my landlord when they're really loud next to me. Well, like super, that's called self-control. That's not love. So the, the standard here isn't what we don't do, it's what we do uh, for, the, for the glory of God for our neighbors. A, a, little, a little deeper about love from 1 Corinthians 13. For our neighbors, love is patient with our neighbors. Love is kind to our neighbors. Love is not envious of what our neighbors have. Love is not boastful to our neighbors about what we have. Love is not arrogant or rude towards our neighbors. Love is not selfish with our neighbors. Love is not irritable to our neighbors or resentful of our neighbors. Anyone uncomfortable yet? Because I am. Love does not applaud evil in our neighbors. Love loves truth. Love endures all things for our neighbors, hopes all things for our neighbors, bears all things for our neighbors, and believes all things for our neighbors. This is what it means like and looks like to love. This is not some namby-pamby hallmark love. This is a love received from Jesus, expended out at our sacrifice for the saving of souls of those around us. So we ask ourselves the question, who is my neighbor? Because if we just focus on the love, this is a heavy weight, right? It's it's Jesus, be like Jesus to your neighbor. Maybe if we ask the question, who is my neighbor? Some relief will come. Who is my neighbor? The Greek word has to do with anyone who is in your Proximity, anyone who is near you. Does that relieve anyone? (laughs) Standard is love, like Christ, and a neighbor is anyone who God puts in our path. It's families, I want you to notice this. Husbands, your closest neighbor is your wife. You are commanded to love her. Wives, you are commanded to love your husbands. You are to love your kids. These are the most important things you can do as a family. But families, I I wanna just pull us back a little bit. These are not your only neighbors. They're your most important neighbors, your husbands, your wives, your kids, but they're not your only neighbors. They're your friends, your classmates, your physical coworkers, or your physical neighbors and your coworkers. Really, a neighbor, we understand a neighbor to be anyone God has providentially, and providentially is a word to describe how God intentionally puts people in a specific place for a specific reason. We understand God not to be accidental with neighbors, that the neighbors you have are not by accident, but God has placed them in your life for a reason. Now, we will read, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And and what we'll do is uh, we'll put a qualifier next to the phrase neighbor. And we'll say, you shall love your handsome neighbor as yourself, right? You shall shall love your rich neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor who likes to barbecue and share like yourself. You shall love your rich neighbor. And so what we do is we try to narrow this down to people that we can accept or people that we like. And what that does, that only exposes our own hypocrisy and self-righteousness. You see, this command is for all kinds of neighbors from all kinds of walks of life, all kinds of hurts, all kinds of questions, all kinds of brokenness, because at the core of who we are, our acceptance is on the grace of God alone. Let me just say this again. As we understand our neighbors, we understand no one to be more deserving of our love than someone else because we are not more or less deserving of God's grace. That when we go to the cross of Calvary, when we go, when we go to Jesus, we find a level ground. The, the person who is the drug addict doesn't need more grace from God. You as a self-righteous Christian don't need less grace from God, but the ground is level. And so he accepts us as we are that we might find freedom and mercy unfettered from him. And that is to roll through us without distinction to our neighbors. Another way to think of this would be to say, your neighbors are your neighbors because God wants you to have them as a neighbor. That's a lot of neighbors. I'll say it again. Your neighbors are your neighbors because God wants them to have you as a neighbor. It's not by accident God has put someone near a Christian. It's not by accident you have the neighbors you have. Another way to say that is, your neighbors are your neighbors because they were created by a God they don't yet know. 
and they need you. So what is the quality of this love? If, if love is self-sacrificial and, uh, and our neighbors are those who are near us, what is, what is the quality of this love? And this, to me, is the hardest part. It is to love someone as much as I love myself. And I love me some me. I said that for all of us. Just to illustrate how difficult this is. Like, just love ourselves. Love making sure we're comfortable, making sure we have what we want, making sure our hobbies are met. Like, we just love ourselves some us. And the command is to say, listen, if you love yourself that much, that is the same energy and the same thought that you were to love someone else. And I want to stop here because I was pondering on this command. And uh, it means two things, and I want to share them with you. One is that we are obligated to live our lives this way as Christians. That we don't get to say, hey, this is not a command. That, hey, this is not what Jesus requires of us. And I don't think anyone here is saying that. But that we don't get the option of opting out. This is the hard work of being like Jesus. But also, the other side of that coin is something that hit me this week. Is that if we are obligated to live our lives for the neighbors who God has put near to us yet far from him, then as a result of that, those people that God has put in our lives to know him, they are entitled to that love. They are entitled to experience the love of God through the Christian. They are entitled to experience free, open-handed grace from the Christians in their lives. That hit me different this week because, like, I get the command piece, but if it's a command, it means there are people in my life who God has put there to receive this grace, and they are entitled to receive that from me by virtue of me being a Christian. So if we're going to love uh, others like we love ourselves, we ask ourselves a question. If I were a single mom with three kids, what would I need or want? Like babysitting 24 hours a day? a year-long spa treatment? If I were a single dad with two kids, what would I need or want? If I was a student at the U trying to make ends meet, what would I need or want? If I were the corporate lawyer who had seemingly everything, who lived next door, what would I need or want? If I was a widow or a widower, what would I need or want? If I was a husband or a wife or an aunt or an uncle, what would I need or want? In other words, God's love is generous and it's intentionally knowing. That is, this requires us to know somebody and then to do something about it to get some skin in the game. I want to just, uh, as we talk about love and all-encompassing this movement, I want to just uh, put some boundaries on it really quick. I had a, when I preached on this in November, a woman came up to me and said, hey, I'm like, I love this idea. I've been praying for my neighbors. Uh, and I want to love my neighbors well, but there's this guy in my apartment complex who I'm sure is a drug dealer. Like, should I go knock on his door and give him a piece of pie? I said, no, you should call the police. And it, like, I, it was a genuine question because this, this is an earnest question. If I love my neighbor, how can I draw them to Jesus? Some of the best things you can do is just to tell the truth. You can love your whole neighbor in that apartment complex by calling the cops and this guy who's dealing drugs. So loving your neighbors doesn't mean a reluctance to tell the truth. There are often times as Christians where we will just have to tell the truth and that is the most loving thing we can do to a world who rejects who Jesus is. But that can't be the only thing we do for a world that rejects who Jesus is. James then says, look, if you're doing this, you're doing well. If you're doing this, keep it up. You're running hard after Jesus. And then if you're not, James says, has a warning. So we've got the encouragement in verse 8, and then the warning in verses 9 through 11. A warning in verses 9 through 11. Really a clarification. But if you show partiality, James says, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. If you have not committed adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. I love these two things. If you have not committed adultery, but you've committed murder, you can't go, I didn't do that. He says, well, no, you've committed murder. You've, you've sinned against the whole law. And this is, this is what uh, the law was for the Jewish people. It was, listen, it, you want to try to follow this law, you're not going to be able to do it. And so it's not a measure of increments. It's if you sin against one part of the law, you're convicted of all of it. And Jesus came to bring grace. To say that's true of everyone who sees the law written on their hearts and sins, and yet I can find, because of who I am, because of who I am, I'm God, and because of what I've done, I've died on the cross and rose in the grave, you can find salvation. 
James, uh, James says the, the most, uh, verse nine, Cato, the most important piece for us to kind of drill in here is partiality. This is the issue they were having. And partiality just means uh, really the Greek is face taking. In other words, you are, you are seeing people just for who they are as they walk in the door and you're making judgments about that and then allowing them to come in based on that. It's to make unjust distinctions between people by treating some people better based on how they look or what they believe or, or whatever than others. And James is particularly speaking about people who are rich and people then who are poor. But I wanna ask the question, why is it that James uses such strong language to describe how, uh, how dangerous partiality is? Like he says, you are sinners convicted and transgressors. There's three different words to describe how strong, how strongly repugnant this is to God. Why is that? Why is partiality to take someone and, 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 to, and to give someone favor based on maybe what they believe or, or what they bring to the table? Well, number one, being partial reveals, reveals a flawed understanding of the image of God. That we understand as Christians that every man, woman, and child ever born was born and stamped with the image of God. And it is because of that image of God that every man, and men, women, and child, regardless of what they believe, where they're from, are worthy of due respect and honor. Not because of what they believe or what they bring to the table, but because of how God has made them. And so then for a Christian to be partial based on what they believe or what they bring to the table or any of that, that, that rejects this idea that everyone is worthy of the same access to Jesus and the cross based on their creation. We then become the identifier or, of who or what is more valuable to us or the church put value on people in front of God. Second reason being partial is so dangerous is being partial or, 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 or being, being partial reveals a self-righteous sense within your own heart. Like we just tend to think of ourselves better than we ought. What James is saying is, listen, like you, you want the rich person and you want to favor him because of what he can bring to the church or, or, and you don't want the guy who, who smells or has mental disorders or is hard to love. That reveals more about your view of yourself than it does about that person. Another way to say it would be like, everyone in this room has people in their lives who don't want to invite them to a dinner party. We are the outcast in someone else's life. There are people in our lives who wouldn't want us at their table. Being partial also reveals our desire to extend the love, of, extend love to those who are easy to love or those who we might benefit from loving. In other words, uh, the rich person who comes in, he's all blinged out and got all the money and all the influence, but he's easy to love, really easy to love. And he brings money into the church. This is great. Well, this guy uh, who has his own issues or is poor and will take more issue, more, more energy to love, well, like that, that's just harder. So why would we do that? Being partial reveals a wrong sense of creation, an inflated sense of ourselves, and it really reveals our heart as it compares to God's heart. We are called to love our neighbor without distinction. Worth writing down, worth remembering for myself, that we are, we are called to love our neighbor without distinction. But what happens when we unconsciously start making distinctions? I want to just stop here and kind of sit in this moment for a little bit and uh, just linger in this cultural moment uh, where, where people become issues. And so what will happen is we will define a person by a certain issue or a label. They no longer have the humanity of being made in the image of God. They are that person, they are that issue, they are that belief, they are that label. Uh, for example, a person who happens to be wealthy is a rich person, not a person who has a wealth. Do you see the distinction? That we, we begin to label and the issue or the modifier, the adjective becomes who that person is. So a person who happens to have wealth is a rich person and in our own mind, they become defined by that thing. Or a person who happens to support abortion becomes an abortion supporter and in our own mind, they're defined wholly by that adjective. Or a person who happens to be same-sex attracted becomes a gay person and in our own mind, they become that and are that. Uh, in full, a person who voted for President Biden or for President Trump is a Trump voter or a Biden voter, and they're ear, they're ear, they're just unchangeably that. And so we have this tendency to create these distinctions in our own mind 
by making people the labels or the issues they believe. And here's what happens. Here's what happens. When a person becomes an issue in our mind, they become easier not to love. When a person becomes a policy, when they become a political supporter, when they become whatever label that is, it is easier for us to not love them and actually still feel holy about it. And let me show you what I mean. When we define people solely by an issue, by a policy or a political affiliation, it's easier than to dehumanize and depersonalize this person. Uh, and, and we end up showing partiality to someone who agrees with us. And so in our, in our efforts as believers to say, you know what, like God has made marriage for man and woman and what a glorious thing. And we protest and we post online and Facebook and we do all of these things. It's easier to, if people are just issues to say, I've done my work, I've proclaimed the goodness of God. And James says, if you have not loved your neighbor, you have not done well. That it is not either or for the Christian. We don't get to protest and proclaim and be prophetic to the culture without loving the people who make up the culture. It is lip service that God rejects. Verse 10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor in all of the law. In other words, it's great if we're the prophetic voice of the culture, but if we don't love our neighbors, we've sinned against the law. I preach a great sermon, but I don't love my neighbor. I don't do well. If I know all of scripture, all of the answers to everything, but I don't love my neighbor, I don't do well. If I come to church and give generously, but I don't love my neighbor, I'm not doing well. James, part of James' argument here is, listen, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you are less likely to sleep with his wife. You're less likely to murder him. You're less likely to steal a sheep. You're less likely to despise him. When we remember that there are people created in the image of God, that, that, that God was impartial with us in his love, that while we were still sinners, while we were still broken, while we were still rejecting him, Christ died for us, all of us, and extended grace upon grace. When we recognize what we have been given and the way that God has designed the gospel to work, we can't be partial. It's not within the DNA of Christianity. And when we do that, we reject all of the standards of which the gospel has saved us on. James reminds us that to do well, we must speak and act. The Christian is required to do both. An encouragement, a warning, and finally, a command. A command. Verse 12. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. I wanna just take a moment with that phrase, law of liberty. We, we don't often view law as liberty. Almost never, in fact. And he is speaking to a group of people who are primarily Jewish, who grew up and understood the Mosaic law as, as something they needed to adhere to, these 613 or so laws. And he's saying, this is not like that that because you have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, you have a law of liberty under which you will be judged. So when Jesus judges you in the end times and he looks at your life and you have an accounting for all that you've done, you will not be condemned. In fact, for your efforts and obedience, you will be commended. I wanna say that again so you understand what's happening here. The law of liberty fueled by grace and empowered by grace makes it possible for us to live our lives, love our neighbors in ways that are creative, risky, empowered by grace, so that at the end time, when we stand before the Lord, we can say, I tried to do this and I messed up. And you know what he does? He goes, grace. He doesn't go, get out before me. I wish you'd gotten it right. There's no condemnation. He says, great job. And you know what? My grace covered that. Not only did my grace cover your foibles and all of your mistakes, but it also empowered your efforts. And so he says, so go, be free to act, be free to say, go and love your neighbor because in the end, you will not be condemned because the grace of God covers you and empowers you. That frees us up to live and to follow Jesus and to do things that the culture may seem weird or that our church, that our church members may say, wait a second. He says, listen, I'm under the law of liberty. I'm doing my best to love my neighbor. In the end, verse 13 
We're commended by God, not condemned by God. Verse 13 says this, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. In other words, partiality, what he's saying here, he's getting at, is it's not, it's not an outward problem. It's an inward problem. That if we're going to show partiality to people based on whatever issue, whatever label we're going to give them, then it really shows that our heart is not as close to God as we thought it would be. That really what it shows is a callousness of heart for people, who, for people whom God has a soft heart for, who he pursues, who he wants to know Jesus. That a calloused heart re, uh, really reflects a lack of understanding or potentially a lack of receiving God's mercy. But this is the beautiful thing about Jesus Christ, that we come before him and are fully known, that he looks at you and says, I know all of the depths of the brokenness and sin, all these patterns, all these proclivities that you won't even recognize, and I'm buying it all. I want every inch of it for your, for your good and my glory so that we can stand before those, those neighbors near us. We can say, listen, I am broken and I am saved to the deepest core of who I am. I am known and I have received mercy. That out of that mercy, I want to spread mercy. Now, someone who thinks, you know what? God didn't have to reach down so far to save me. I only, I only need this much grace. We'll only extend that much mercy. We'll only extend that much grace. That our capacity for grace and mercy is directly relative to how well we understand we needed that grace and mercy. And what, what, what James is saying is, listen, it's more likely that if you're, if you're just consumed with partiality, that your heart is heart and calloused and maybe has never received the mercy of God to begin with. And for those who don't give mercy out of the, out of the goodness of God, for those who don't give mercy, they will, be, they will receive judgment for being far from God. People who understand they've received mercy will give mercy. And this is a prime indicator of a healthy faith. So just quickly, I'm gonna land the plane I promise, with two opportunities. We've talked about loving our neighbors and, and the impediments of, of, of making people issues and how easy it is then to protest but not love those who are near us, right? I wanna give two opportunities uh, this morning to, to love your neighbors. Number one, within the body. Uh, over the course of the last few months, like our elder board has just uh, sensed uh, because of the pandemic, this growing disconnection in our church right? This growing uh, kind of disconnection of relationship. And uh, John 13, 34 through 35 says this, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, that just as I have loved you, this is Jesus to the disciples, you are to love one another. Get this verse 35, by this all people know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. In other words, if we love one another well and pursue relationships and, and pursue grace and mercy, the world will see how well we love one another and see God. And so we just, man, we're passionate about this and realize the pandemic's made it harder to connect and we're more comfortable not meeting with people. We're more comfortable uh, doing, not doing things with folks and, and meeting. And, uh, and that's not good that man or woman should be alone. And so what we wanna do is wanna offer you uh, a way to love one another. Uh, there's this card on your seat that you may have sat on or you may have uh, put in your Bible. <clears throat> it's a City Brew gift card. And we wanted to, wanted to show you how important we think this is that you know each other in the church, that you love one another well, is we've put $10 on this card, which is enough for like two cups of coffee. Like you're not gonna get a super califragilistic frappuccino or whatever with it, but like, <clears throat> but it's enough. It's enough for two cups of coffee. And City Brew, you can actually go there in person and like, you don't have to go there. You can go inside. There's two, two places. Amen to that. So here's what we'd love you to do. We'd love you to take this card and think of someone in the church who you don't know very well who you've been looking to get, uh, get to know, who you've just missed hanging out with. And this isn't, this isn't for someone you already know and hang out with all the time, your buddies and whatever. Like this is for someone in this church who God has put us in your heart and for some reason you just haven't pursued. Maybe it's someone in your missional community. Maybe it's someone here in the room right now and you say, listen, I wanna, I wanna take you out to coffee or tea or whatever it is. Uh, and I wanna hang out and get to know you. Like in the past year, this church has had so many new people and it's awesome to see so many new faces that God has drawn to this church in a pandemic. Man, but we want to love one another well. We want to make sure that we know names. And so, look, invite someone to coffee. If this isn't your thing, uh, I just want to just say this. This is not like a cup of coffee for you on your way to work. This isn't for your caffeine fix. Like, so it, it, if you don't want to participate, like, that's totally okay. Just leave it on your, leave it on your chair afterwards. No big deal. No one will know. Uh, but we want to make sure that we give you the opportunity and show you how important we think this is. Uh, the second thing is, so loving your neighbor within the church, making sure that, that we are taking care of those in the body of Christ well. The second is, 
loving our neighbor uh, near us uh, in the community. And I wanna, we've been talking about this for three or four weeks. <clears throat> and so these are the gift bags we put together. And so one is for uh, families with kids uh, and they've got uh, a bridge, bridge pizza gift card, a coffee gift card, some games they can play with the family. Uh, it's kind of like a movie night in a bag. And then there's, for everyone who's not a family, maybe you've got a friend, a classmate in, uh, at the U or uh, a neighbor or a couple who's, who's near, don't have kids. It's the same thing, a gift card to bridge pizza and some coffee. Uh, like when we talk about loving our neighbors as ourselves, like I'm hoping one of you drops this on my, on my doorstep because I want one of these is what I'm saying. Like I love bridge pizza. We wanna give you something you would be proud to give your neighbors. Something that's not stingy, something with no strings attached. You can write your name on it and, and give it to them. And the hope, the hope is that we can empower you creatively uh, and with these things to help build relationships that at some point can bear the weight of hard truth. That is, that's the whole goal. The whole goal is that, is that we can put you in a position to be known in your community as a Christian who is faithful and who loves their neighbors. So at some point, we can talk to them about sin and rebellion, and they can hear the good news of the gospel. That takes a big relationship, and I'll throw as many bridge pizza gift cards at you to make that happen. <laughs> just, I'm just saying. Like we just, we just, we feel very strongly that we want to empower and, and creatively give you opportunities. A after this service, uh, grab one or two maximum. If you've got people on your mind who you're praying for in your, in your realm of influence, whether it's a coworker or a classmate at the U or, or whatever, grab one of these, take it, pray over it and give it away this week. Ask God to move through an act of generosity. Look, God has called us to love our neighbors and to do it well. If we do that well, church, we are doing well. Let's go love our neighbors. Go do that together. Let's pray. God, we are so grateful that you have given us a way to know you, that you have given us a way to be known. God, that as we know more of you, as we pursue you, God, that our hearts would be burdened for those who don't yet know you. As we, uh, as we pursue theology, as we pursue uh, scriptural knowledge, as we pursue your son, God, that, that we would not be content just to know and to change, but to know and to help others change. It would make your name known. God, I pray, that, <laughs> I pray that this week and the next week that this church would be strengthened by edifying relationships, by new connections, by uh, praying together, by coffee. God, I pray that over the next few weeks, that these bags as they go out into the community, God, that, that you, would, you would use them to change hearts that you would move people from cynic to skeptic, that you would move people uh, to a knowledge of you that is new, that you would use your people to proclaim your goodness to those who are near to us, yet far from you. God, we pray that you would do this for your glory and our joy. Amen.